What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Dips to Rips podcast. We've been on a little bit of a vacation, but rightfully so, Howard and I deserve it. Speaking of Howard, that is my co-host, the legend Howard uh, Greenberg, crypto hondo, so to speak. How you doing, my man? I'm doing great, Charlie. How you doing today, buddy? Ah, man, I'm excited to get uh, Chatty Kathy with you today. We got a lot to cover. Now, I don't want to kind of harp on the older news. You know, we've we've been on a two-week hiatus. You were on vacation. You were seeing your pops. I'm glad that you're able to spend time with your family. We had a lot of things going on, of course. But here we are today. And uh, shortly after the CPI data, uh, which has severely affected the market, and then today there's big news with the uh, Ethereum merge going on. So... I guess we could start very quickly, right? Because there's other news as well, big news in my opinion. Um, and then we'll kind of, we could kind of kind of lead into the merge and then talk about how CPI has affected both of our uh, markets overall. But I found it interesting. You and I were talking right before we started recording here about uh, you know you were you're briefly breaking down this exchange, this new exchange that's opening up and the participants that are involved. And that's what intrigues me is the participants. We're talking about institutions teaming up, right? Usually in the stock market, they're kind of betting against each other. They're in their own world, but really they're kind of going back and forth. They're really clawing at each other's clientele and, and their trading opportunities and money and et cetera. And now these guys are working together in a totally different venture. So Howard, Let's talk about that really quick. What do you think about the big boys? And you can name them off here. Kind of sure. getting together in a good old gang and your thoughts about what this is going to do for, you know, maybe the crypto markets and more importantly, the ripto, uh, the retail traders going forward here. Sure. We've had uh, some some big news across a couple of different fronts. You know, first thing that came out was that Fidelity, who had already offered um, Bitcoin trading through their 401k programs is now looking at adding in the next month or two uh, Bitcoin trading through their regular brokerage services to regular retail customers. So that was sort of the first you know, thing to drop. The latest news, and we had gotten hints of this during the CFTC hearing that was recently done uh, when Ken Griffin sort of hinted at this, uh, Citadel Securities is partnering with Schwab, with Virtu Financial, with Fidelity, um, and I'm leaving out one or two of the other big Nuts. players, like Jump Capital um, and, and others, to start their own venture, which is their own crypto exchange. And they <laughs> hired, they promoted or put the CEO as the former head of business development for Citadel Securities. Then they added in like the chief legal counsel from Fidelity or Schwab, excuse me. Everybody sort of got a seat at the table there. But they're coming hard after the crypto industry native exchanges. Um, if you looked at their press release, everything in there was talking about, number one, how compliant they're going to be. You know, they're starting off. The only coin they've guaranteed they're starting off with is Bitcoin, um, because we know that is the only coin that has been widely accepted to not be a security. It was never sold. It was mined. So there was no ICO, no central authority over it. Um, and then we many people think Ethereum will join in that and then probably Bitcoin Cash, the derivatives of Bitcoin. Um, but it's a big deal because, number one, you know, it, it's going to battle Coinbase and BlackRock, who had just announced a partnership, right, um, that they had integrated Aladdin, which is BlackRock's institutional uh, program that they allow their institutional uh, investors to use for investing now integrated Coinbase Prime. And now for all the other institutions that do business with either Citadel or Schwab um, or Fidelity, they'll be able to purchase crypto directly through this exchange EDX. But the difference is, is this is also looking to be retail facing. So this will be an exchange okay. that anyone can sign up for. Whereas with Aladdin, you know, you can't just say, I have $1,000 BlackRock, let me in. Right, right, they're right, going right, to laugh right, at right. you and, uh, and say, no, thank you. So, so what do you is, think this means for the retail trader, good or bad? Indifferent. So a couple of things. I mean, I think that Citadel being involved in anything is bad, quite frankly. I mean, <laughs> I think they are the big, big bad wolf on the on the street. You know, there's already been accusations in the markets against Binance, especially, and a little bit less, a little bit about FTX and a little bit about Coinbase, about front running. And what that means is in crypto, there is a 
delay between when you enter the order and when it actually gets posted to the blockchain. Sure. And, sure. and there are, you know, if you have enough technology and enough money, you can front run those trades. So, you know, of course, but out, isn't that the MO of Citadel with high frequency trading and virtue that's as what well? I was gonna say is now you're taking the experts at it and they're saying, and one of the things they're stressing is we're gonna charge less than the current incumbents do. So if they're you know, Citadel doesn't want to make less money than Coinbase makes. So they're right. making their money off something else, which is us. Um, right. there is no doubt there. You know, the thing that I do think is interesting with this and that I think that you're going to have to see the Coinbase's and the FTX maybe work together um, in Gemini is that they're going to do combined liquidity. So we've talked about earlier in podcasts here how every crypto exchange has its own order book. There is no central order book. In right, 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 right. So it means that there's more slippage, you know, there's more, you know, more room or spread in between the ask and bid prices sometimes. And there's, you know, you might put in something, especially in a market order, to buy it at hundred dollars, and it might not fill to hundred and four dollars. Right, right, so right. So Citadel saying you won't have that slippage with us because we're going to have this huge liquidity. So while there will be an EDX exchange, what it looks like is that you're going to see Fidelity use that same exchange, but it'll be white labeled as Fidelity, and Schwab will put it into the integrated into their brokerage, white label it in, but it will all be working out of that same liquidity. So you I know, had a also, lot of people, a lot of people in the crypto industry took advantage of the different pricing and exchanges, right? I mean, a lot of people were just purely FTX, arbitraging. FTX made all its money originally in Alameda off of yeah. that. Yeah, they arbitraged off of the difference between the Japanese and Korean prices in 2017 and 18. Um, so tremendous. just really quickly, folks, if you're not sure what HFT or high frequency trading is and really how companies like Virtu and Citadel uh, kind of take advantage of the retail market, they have systems that will recognize certain behavioral trading inflow outflow. And what what the the big boys do, and most notably Citadel, is that they pay, you know, tens, if not hundreds of million dollars a month, or mm -hmm. let's say a year, right? Probably tens of millions of dollars a month. But they do it to be able to get the best and the fastest data because they count on not even milliseconds, like even a, a much, much smaller time frame to get those orders in before everybody else and then to get their orders uh, exited before everybody else. And, you know, they may be making a penny or two on each trade with a extremely high level of success, but they're doing this million times over in, in you know, a day. And those pennies really do add up because of the size right. and liquidity that they're trading. And, and they did not say that this stock. is going to be out of Linden, New Jersey, the same place that most of the data centers for all the exchanges except for. So New they're going to be directly there. piped in and, and yeah. have Edison that. New like, York. Yeah. yeah. And, and Virtu, for those that don't know, it's actually a publicly traded stock. But their claim to fame was something like they went on a four year streak of not having a losing day. Right. Yeah, and, you know, it's crazy, uh, they're, like you said, they they're they're basically scalping a, fractions of a penny, but they're doing <laughs> it millions of times a day using algorithmic trading oh, to yeah. do that. And the key is they actually use ma microwave technology supposedly for their yeah. communication that's even faster than fiber optic or anything else. So they, that's a great point, uh, Howard, because obviously in Chicago we have the Chicago Board of Trade, which is the right. commodities market, right? And in Aurora, uh, in Peoria, Aurora, Aurora, yeah. they built out these huge towers and satellite dishes. And so actually, instead of being plugged into landlines underneath and just paying for that access, they use that microwave system directly straight to Connecticut, New Jersey, New York. And it, again, it's faster than the fiber optic cabling underneath, which a lot of you know normal firms such as TD Ameritrade would use to send data back and forth through the exchanges. So, you know, that's a great, great point. Now we know that these guys are going to be plugged in direct. They're they're basically going to take the same, you know, kind of theory and process it looks like and try and apply it to crypto. Maybe, just maybe, they've already been kind of working it back and forth a little bit, you know? Oh, yeah, they're not doing this without pre-testing it. They already yeah. said that they tested <laughs> these systems through their, I guess they're, the exchange that they own, um, their stock exchange, I guess is MEXC. I'm not that familiar with it. Yeah, possibly, but, um, yeah. 
Yeah, but that they own that together, and that's what they're using the technology from that for this. Yeah, they saw inefficiencies in the market. They see that there's a you know there are pennies that are slipping through the cracks, so to speak, in slippage at a Coinbase or at an FTX because you know currently the way crypto works is everybody has their own order book. So it means when you're buying from Coinbase, you're only dealing with other Coinbase customers, right? And that's the order book. And what they're going to do the is the liquidity pool, yeah, combine liquidity, and they're trying to attract. You know, Jump Capital, which is a huge firm in your town, and they're out of yep. Chicago, I believe. Um, you know, they were they're a big traditional hedge fund, but they're also probably the largest um market maker in crypto, and they are heavily wooing them. That is their first goal. They've sort of already made it clear that they're meeting with Jump to pull them out of Coinbase's liquidity pool and Gemini's liquidity pool and into their own. Um Fun so, fact, you know, Howard. I actually strongly considered Jump because uh, my friend's girlfriend at the time was the floor manager there when it was a prop firm. But then they got bought out and then all of a sudden requirements were like yeah. double degrees in yeah, you yeah. know computer engineering and finance and and oh it's not Ivy League, get the heck out of here, you know. Right, exactly. And, they, and they, now they they're exactly what you're talking to about. The big time, big quickly. They yeah, went yeah. from, a, a, you know, from a disruptor to a incumbent and a matter of, you know, they very similar to what we saw with Alameda and FTX, you know, where you, you know, who would have thought that Alameda and FTX weren't even in existence in 2017. Sam Bankman Fried was still working for James Street and, you know, and doing high frequency trading for them. And in three years now is the second richest man in crypto. Yeah, I'm I'm look I'm trying to look it up really quickly, jump trading's assets under management, but I know that they went nuts at some point. They went something like 150 million assets under management to being like over a billion dollars after uh they became an HFT firm. It was something crazy like that. And I know that they that they were focused primarily on equities. And then they shifted and started like really building out this like huge like firm geared towards crypto. You know, this was actually just prior to the peak, uh, probably a few months, maybe even almost a half a year prior. And apparently they were actually knocking it out of the park. And I don't know like what what their you know overall results are now in crypto, but you know, it seemed like they were looking to apply a lot of the same kind of gaming theory that they approached, um, you know, day trading aspect or in Absolutely. some respect, which was jump is is fairly unique because it's not the same as looking for that little pricing discrepancy um, that Citadel and maybe Virtu would be looking for there. They take a different mathematical mo model in terms of approach, it seems. And it seems like while they are a bit of an HFT firm, they're, they're very different in their approach and whatever they're doing, they're extremely skilled over there. Um, I don't know if there's their office is still there, but their office was literally right above uh, where the TD Ameritrade headquarters in Chicago was. So they were piped directly into TD servers there. Um, you know, this is uh, it, it's big news, and more importantly, it, it's interesting that there's going to be a lot more money coming into crypto. So, I wonder if crypto is still going to be able to kind of moon the way they did previously. Um, you know, when when the bull market is strong, or do you think there's going to be a little bit more tempered, tempered as in like instead of you know 180 percent gains in a three week period? That will be more progressively over six months. Do you think it'll be more, you know, maybe slightly controlled, less less volatility? Um, well, I mean, what the promise of it is, or what people will talk about, is by bringing them into the market. You know, you're going to see, and what we've seen is when institutions come in, they're not a, a long only business. You right. know, a lot of crypto firms were really, you know, unilateral. A lot of them would had no, you know, that's why we've seen so much contagion, so much problem by companies like Galaxy Digital or even Skybridge or some of these others is they were long only funds. And yeah, now, you, now you're realizing, bullish. yeah, now you're realizing you can't be that you need to be bi-directional. <laughs> so, you know, so bringing Citadel in and some of these institutions doesn't mean necessarily that they're going to go long on crypto. They might be going short on crypto. No, that um, and, and that's what know. I'm talking about. Cause you know how 
when the markets get one-sided, it is purely one-sided. It is like pure direction. Nobody's standing in front of that train because you know that they're getting forcibly liquidated. And that's the question. Like, will Citadel kind of temper that and press it down and then reverse it back up and, and kind of go through the ebbs and flows of a normal trajectory versus that just you know, basically condensed indicator chart, and then all of a sudden it's one big green candle. Right. Yeah. Yes, yes, I think a little bit. In other words, you know, that's part of the maturation of any type of financial service, right? Sure. Is yeah. we're getting yeah. we're getting more mature. They will provide that. You know, some of the questions you're gonna that we'll have to see is number one. You know, without more regulatory clarity, you're sort of limited to a small sector of coins. Um, so, you know, crypto, crypto is more than just Bitcoin and Ethereum, and that might be all they that they're trading. So, you know, your crypto crypto native firms will focus on the avalanches and the, you know, the the Cardano's and the ones that don't fall under their purview. And then secondly, you know, while Citadel has a lot of money, these crypto whales have a lot of money. Oh, um, you, you know, got and that not, right. And yeah. And they're not afraid to to battle it out. You know what I mean? Is, you know, you've seen um you know some of these guys they'll leverage it to the hilt i mean just look at what happened to three arrows and some of these others so you know that that's the question is will they learn from the mistakes of others and mm. you know have hedges in place i think you're going to see more of that um i don't know if you saw do kwan now has an arrest warrant out for him <laughs> um today <laughs> that's pretty big that, news dude. i forgot about that that would that's probably something we should definitely touch on um i think that's a good thing you know i hope they I hope that next is the guy from Voyager, Stephen Ehrlich, and then followed by Alex Mashinsky at Celsius. Those people yeah. deceived the market very badly. You know, they put out reassurances when they knew that they were crashing. Um, and instead of people getting their money out, they made sure they got their money out first. So, you know, that's, you know, that's what Do Kwan's, you know, he's being charged with capital market crimes in South Korea. That's you know, it's weird because... I don't see like in terms of the US government going hard up against guys like that but I see I've seen cases recently where the US courts are listening to you know these like I don't know I guess I guess they're class action lawsuits against NFT projects and now they're holding you know these project developers and creators um I don't remember if one was found guilty, but I know that that they were going to trial. They brought charges. They brought yeah, charges. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like, situation. and that's what's really interesting because now, you know, because pseudo tied, but su very different in terms of markets. You know, a lot of the market participants are the same, but you know, behaviorally, you know, we we see a lot of divergence as well. And you know, you, you bring up the point, you know, in South Korea, he's obviously going to face those charges. He's South Korean. You know, obviously, I'm South Korean, too. Where is this pig going to run to? Where can he go? He's in Singapore. They he's, know where he is. So he's actually still in Singapore. Yeah. All the guys that they just filed arrest warrants against are all in Singapore, supposedly. And now, I don't he, know. You might know extra, better if there's extradition. Yeah. I mean, to my knowledge, Singapore has extradition. It does yeah, in the U.S. Okay. At least uh, to the U.S. Yeah. So I'm going to assume that it, they have some sort of, you know, procedural in place there. Um, you know, and, and even when he was interviewed recently on that Coinage podcast, he made it clear that, you know, there he does see the threat of jail time. Um, you know, and I, I think you're going to see that. The merge is happening tonight. We've talked about it. Yeah, exciting. Of Seven years in the waiting, buddy. Seven years. All these tests, all the hype that's leading up to it. What are your feelings tonight? You think that uh, Ethereum goes to the moon or Ethereum? So, oh, goes as you know, I've been, I, I think that we're set up for maybe uh, the GameStop style of MOAS. There is so many shorts on this right now that it's not funny. I was showing you just before we went on. It is absolutely. Want me to share that? Yeah, yeah, Howard, you could share it. You got the. You okay, got the, let me share this right here for you. To the moon and Moas, by the way, is M O A S S, which is a common theme for the memes. They usually say with AMC, but it stands for Mother of All Short Squeezes, the Moas. I don't want so, anybody. I don't want us to get you know flagged for. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So here, here over here, you can take a look, and this is what's called the funding rate. And the funding rate is the fee that you pay to either put a long or a short position into the perpetual futures. So, you know, even more than spot volume, 
derivative market has been much larger in the crypto market than even the spot volume. And as you can see, Bitcoin has been at pretty much a positive um, funding rate, which means that the long bets are having to pay the shorts to place a position. Mm -hmm. When we go to Ethereum, take a look at this chart. It's at record negative funding rates. So if we don't see Ethereum go back towards 1200 or so over the next couple of days, we could be set to see the hugest short squeeze in the history of crypto. You think we punched through 2000? Oh, if, if it happens, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, it, if it happens, if it hits, if it really goes the other way, the liquidations are so large, you could hit 2200. Um, and we're talking and about I, fast. We're not talking about. Yeah, oh yeah, this would be quacks, and it would come right back down. Yeah, oh, yeah. Then the goes spot, up fast. Know, then the sell orders would hit. So I mean, we're going to do. I'm doing a yolo trade tonight about midnight. I'm going to go long on a, a leverage trade on Ethereum uh, and try to catch that with a really short stop loss in case it does do what all the traders think are going to happen. But when's the last time 95 percent of the trading world thought something was going to happen and it did? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, the, the, you're, you're, so this is kind of um, relative to what past history has told us, right? With like Bitcoin having right, sell you know, the news. See exactly. the, we see the run up, and then when it happens, we see the tank, right? And that's what people oh. are kind of betting, betting on right now. After this, e, you know, ETH merge, we're going to see the tank. And the only thing I want to add to that is a lot of this is also hedges against spot positions. That so there are a lot of too. Ethereum whales that to to hedge against their their long positions because they're staking their Ethereum, which means they can't touch it for another six or eight months. Right, 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 right. They're they're using this as a hedge against that. Um. So you know, so all your Ethereum whales are included in this, and they're willing to lose their spots, so they won't pull these orders because they're hedges. Um, and again, and same thing. Those see... hedges have to cover. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It doesn't matter what it is. The bottom line is, you know, we're at a negative 0.17. That's about as high as you can go. A lot of times you see um, exchanges cap it at 0.15. So the fact that the average is below that is insane. I mean, you're talking, when we looked at Bitcoin on the positive side, it is only, when I say positive, the, the record short for Ethereum for Bitcoin is, I'm trying to just get it into this zone here. Hold it one second so I can see this a little better. You know, at this point, it was negative 0.02. Ethereum, like I said, is negative 1.7. <laughs> so, the you know, just put that into a ratio. I mean, if you look, the, 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 on this, going all the way back to March, the lowest it had been before that was literally 0.03. Right, right. You know what I mean? As you're yeah. going from 0.03 to 0.17. You now know, I want I want you times. folks I want you folks to know that this is obviously we're just speculating we don't know what's going to happen. Right. And oh more yeah, importantly, it, it definitely follow that. Yeah, more more importantly, you know, no matter right right or wrong, it's always about management. But in theory, what we're looking at here is something that is really set up in in an extreme manner that if it doesn't work out like everybody anticipates there could be a very large and extremely predictable move and right. it's 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 liquidation it's panic it's it's panic selling uh, that you know cuz it becomes an emotional state it's like why isn't this dumping why is it this dumping and there's always traders out there that react quicker than others right and so if we see what we would say the smart big money start to dump right away then we're going to see the rest of the market following suit and then it becomes this like rolling theme. Cascades. Yeah. yeah. And then buyers are like, oh my gosh, we're going up. And then they rip it in. They chase, and then it they becomes chase. very one-sided in this situation. The, the one thing I wanted to pull up is show you also the amount. There's $8.33 billion in this short interest. So it's not, you know, these aren't small numbers. These no, are, no. you know, record numbers. These are numbers that only Bitcoin normally sees. We're right, seeing, we've seen more money on CME on Ethereum futures than Bitcoin futures, which is not something you normally see. But part of that, that exactly is, is this hedge. You know what I mean? Is again, right. you know, all of these big, you know, institutions having to hedge their position 
because, you know, if it does go to a thousand, they don't want to lose, you know, 50 percent or 20 for 35 percent of the value in the next 12 hours, <laughs> you know, and that, that could, you know. Let, let's talk about this then, right? So now our markets, both our markets, were severely affected by the CPI report that came out. Um, the SPY and the NASDAQ. So two things I want to say. Uh, on the day the CPI report came out, all 100 of the top NASDAQ 100 stocks finished in the red. That's crazy to me, okay? And number two, even as bearish as this market has been, it was the biggest down day for the S&P 500 since June of 2020. 20, 2020, that. guys, that was when the market was at its absolute ugliest over the last couple of years. So it's it was a severe and violent reaction. And most people are pointing towards the uh, core number of 8.3 coming in at above the 8.1 expected. But we got to make sure that we understand this data point, how we're reading this, and in my opinion, how Wall Street is reading this. We are coming from 8.5 to 8.3. So the core effect of inflation is softening here. But the non-core or excluding gas and food, that inflation metric is going up. And in fact, it doubled up from where it was the previous report. And it was also above expectations. In fact, it was double of expectations. Now, that's the key factor here, because now we could say, well, inflation is attributed to, you know, rising gas costs. And of course, that affects our supply chain issue. And now supply chain issues are are being corrected. And and what gas is down for 90 days in a row. Gas prices are falling 90 days in a row. Yet we're seeing other effects uh, or other assets, other things being affected by inflation that's not tied directly to food, and gasoline. And that is what the market is violently reacting to because of why. Because the Fed now has to change its tune. Now, at the very minimum, we're looking at 75 basis point hike. We're starting to slowly price in the idea of a 100 basis point hike in the September meeting, which is next week. And November and December are starting to price in the possibility of a 75 basis point hike which in turn is something the market didn't digest, didn't price in, and basically priced it in all within one day. My goodness. Now, what do you think that CPI data and the the effects of the stock market is going to do with crypto? Do you think we're going to start, you know, or continue to move somewhat sympathetically here? Yeah, I definitely think correlation for risk off and risk on investments is the same. You know, the one thing with crypto, it's the most liquid. You can it, you can get out of it 24-7. So, you know, we tend to see crypto get hit even a little harder um, and risk off. You know, DXY is something I'm watching. Uh, I was quoted in Coindesk today on, on a couple of articles. And, you know, my two takeaways from CPI were, number one, I had listened to Fed Governor Waller speak on Friday, and I thought he put it pretty in basic terms. There were three scenarios that they saw coming this week. Um, one scenario was inflation really is moving uh, in the right direction, in which case he saw uh, no need to go to the 4% that they've been talking about by the end of the year. Right. So that, that was what we were calling the Fed pivot, right? There had been a lot of talk about a Fed pivot. Would they, you know, would they pivot? Would they slow down? Well, that's gone. You know what I mean? The second scenario, which is the one I think you and I fall into, that 75 now, 75 to 50 in November type thing. And we max out around four at the end of the year um, is still in play. But the other thing that he said is if inflation doesn't start to move in their direction, you know, down, that they will be well above. And that was the words that caught my ears. And I went, well, well, what, well, what did he just say? Well, well above. And then I checked what? it in Bloomberg, who did a pretty good coverage on it. And they, it's right there in writing, you know, well above 4%. And I think that that caught people, myself included. And I mean, I'm totally... You know, this week, you know, usually I'm hitting you up for trade ideas. I haven't hit you up for one this week, have I? No. I'm literally like I'm sitting on my hands till I hear FOMC. You know, I'm sometimes. Gonna, I mean, I, 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 I'm, you know, um, going to fully explain. I mean, uh, towards the end of the day, um, prior to the CPI report, uh, I got into two shorts and one long, and I actually said that the long is the hedge on the shorts. Obviously, if I'm going two and one. 
And, you know, certainly the, the names that we were shorting was SPLK and CarMax. And um, I was long TTD. Well, TTD, I exited right at the open, probably about 15 minutes after its first pop. And thank God I did, because then the market started to roll over. Uh, in KMX, only up around $6 in profits right now. We did kind of peel it off, but made new 52-week lows. You know, I, I took it right before the 52-week lows, and then it punched through. And now it has potential of being a huge breakout play, because if you look at the weekly chart, there's nothing underneath. In my, in my scenario with equities, I actually think that we're going to bounce back a little bit but we have to watch what's going to happen here on Friday. Um, this week happens to be quad witching. Historically, quad witching hasn't been great for the markets. Now, most are anticipating all the activity to take place on Friday, which it absolutely could. But there are times over the last two years that the day before quad witching, which is Thursday, we've seen some crazy, crazy market activity. So I'm not sure if Thursday is going to be the hard dump day and then we rip it back on Friday or vice versa. I just don't know. However, with the way that the market settled up today, I think there's actually a chance that we're going to gap open tomorrow. And if the sell offs going to come, it's when we go from green to red and pull it back. So I actually our, took out a trade in TSM and TQQQ in anticipation we're going to see a small pop both with great floors here in the near term. TSM actually had news today. Um, shared it with you, but Apple's going to be using some of their components in the new iPhone 14, I believe, or the or future iPhones. It may not be the 14, but future iPhones and future MacBooks. And that's a big grab for a company like TSM, right? Anytime you get Apple as a clientele and you're a component maker, it basically just screams that they're throwing billions of dollars at you on a quarterly basis so that's all obviously going to be a booster what's the con well tsm is a taiwanese company so this actually just is more of a macro event when we take the countries involved taiwan versus china right that's the cons in this situation but you know i i feel like there's going to be a lot of fluctuation and over this next few weeks i'm actually going to you know really anticipate a big bearish move obviously with the fomc week next week you know we've seen historically the markets actually love jerome powell uh the, everybody just points out to the one time he spoke to, at jackson hole where he tanked the markets but how about every other time he's on the mic uh on the mic and the market shoots up one and a half two percent while he's talking they may be already up one percent for the day but it shoots up I've seen the queues go on $10 runs while he's talking. That's about an hour. And so I don't know if that's going to be the case here. Obviously, what the Fed actions, they're going to dictate what's going to take place. You know, it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if Jay Powell comes in extremely hawkish here in the near term. But I think that we're in for a rebound. The market's held pretty strongly here. We could have sold off. The SPY is making new lows. The Q's got right down there. Twice we hit that rebound. And then that last half hour of today, that last half hour was bonkers. Some of these stocks were putting on more volume that hour than any of the other, other hours that they traded. Usually the first hour of the day will have the highest volume bar. Now, the second thing I want to point out that's kind of making me a little bit more bullish is I feel the market is dragging, not because of the large collective of names, but a small collection of names. We, 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 we used to call them the FANG stocks, right? Everybody would say, oh, FANG this and FANG that, but it's not FANG anymore, right? The hot new thing is what? Matana, right? Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, uh, Tesla, NVIDIA, uh, Alphabet, Matana, Akuna Matana. But it, these are the names that are progressively weak. I mean, how were the markets at almost the lows? And then we see Snowflake breaking out, making new highs, and Etsy, and DoorDash. And I talked to you about Coinbase being nuts at the end of the day. And so it seems to me right now, the market is somewhat more attracted to high beta names and growth type names as opposed to the tried and true. 
Apple did not make new highs. Amazon, Google, Microsoft, none of them did. They may have rebounded. Actually, out of all those names, Tesla was the best performer. They remained strong. They never got back to the lows of the day. And that kind of, you know, when I see growth getting stacked like that, when I see cloud names and I see cybersecurity and I see fintech holding, PayPal is breaking out. And, you know, I see these names as the leaders. I don't look at that as a bearish market ever. I look at that as a short-term bull demand market. And that, for me, is kind of the key indication and maybe a possible learning moment for everybody here. It's that key indication that we could see a progressive bounce coming into play. Otherwise, why would people put risk on in a name like Snow when in other market conditions, when it gets ugly, that stock will be down like 15 points. It'll be down like 8 to 10%. Apple will be down 3%. It doesn't make sense. So this is kind of what I'm seeing here, this market positioning self. Do you happen to see anything outside of obviously the event coming in that may be kind of keying in on that in the crypto side as well? Not so much on the crypto side, but I I would ask you, do you think that's a little bit of a sectorial change? You know, people were getting into the energy names thinking that energy was going to take off, you know, with the shortages and everything else. So now, you know, and they were sort of ignoring tech for a while and that, you know, when we were seeing the downfall of that. So that that's my question for you. You know, again, I'm not an expert on the. On, sure, on sure. That. I mean, yeah, it's very possible we could see that rotation, but energy was pumping earlier, like NAT gas was going nuts. And a lot of the NAT gas, NAT gas names were going nuts. And by the way, over the next six months, I would much rather be long U, uh, UNG versus USO, yeah. which is the NAT gas ETF versus the crude ETF. Not the biggest fan of crude going forward. I am a big fan of Nat Gas. Now, in terms of rotations, it's very possible, but usually when the market's weak, the leaders are actually in these growth sectors. Like cloud's the one that usually get beat to hell, right? And, you know, really, what was really dynamic, it kind of jump-started everything, was Twilio. Twilio has been getting severely punished. This is a name that investors really loved over the last four or five years. It's one of the greatest, you know, uh, cloud name uh, performers. You know, Okta is another one. MongoDB is another one. You know, Viva Systems is another one. But usually these stocks will just get pounded and beat down, right? If Apple would be down, if Apple, let's say the two leaders, right? Amazon and Microsoft, Azure and AWS. If they were down, the sector and, and the names that are tied to the sector, whether SAAS or uh, they have, you know, whatever, their business model built around cloud, if those stocks were down 1%, 2%, these stocks would be down 5 to 7%. And so now I'm seeing Microsoft, let's see what Microsoft is up today or down today. So Microsoft actually at the very end finished slightly positive up 23 cents. Amazon did a little bit better, up 1.36%. Snow, 5.63%. I mean, that screams to me. Maybe it's just a one-sided trade, but it kind of screamed to me here that the market is putting risk on into beta. And generally speaking, when risk on goes to beta, we see a nice market rally. That's really been the consistency, especially in 2022. But if we earmark it back over the last five years, the biggest driver in the NASDAQ obviously was the Montana or the ex-FANG stocks. But the, the, the leading sectors of, in terms of growth and return was all tied to cloud and cybersecurity. And so CrowdStrike, really it was Cloudflare, NET, that I saw going nuts today. Uh, Palo Alto had their split today. They were looking in the dumpster until the very end of the day, and then they went off. Um, We saw snow breaking out. And then we look at names like Etsy and Dash, which don't have ties to cloud, but they're high beta names, right? They're big movers. They're newer names. You know, Etsy is in the S&P 500, but generally speaking, hasn't been a great performer. They were holding up well and exploding in the markets. And so this really caught me off guard at the end of the day because it really looked like we're going to crap the bed and just it was just going to be all sorts of ugly, which a lot of people did anticipate. And yet here we are, here we are, 
the markets were trying to get driven down, driven down, driven down, and the NASDAQ held strong. And we saw this huge, huge rally at the end of the day. So that huge rally in terms of signal, and we'll see tomorrow if I'm right, Howard, how we open. But if we open, let's say, somewhere around three quarters of a percent to one percent higher in the NASDAQ, that that last hour of the day or the last half hour of the day, what it's telling me is that sellers were liquidating. The short sellers in these stocks were liquidating and some very late high demanding buyers came in and they're positioning themselves for tomorrow. And that made me feel good because I took on along in the queues. I took along in TSM and we'll just have to wait and see. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be here tomorrow because of my birthday. My buddies are taking me out to golf, but I will be there right about the open just to kind of guide everybody and kind of go forth. But that being said, Howard, next week is a big week for you and I, right? Obviously, you have a bigger event tonight, but next week is going to be pretty, pretty huge on the FOMC. Do you feel that the FOMC is going to come out, you know, dovish or hawkish? hawkish. Or maybe neutral. They've made it clear. I mean, they're not going to. There's no pivot. It's over. Yeah. I, I mean, I hear you. I, you know, I, I would say that if the, the way that I'm kind of looking at how the voting is going to kind of play out here, I would actually be surprised if everybody was unanimous in only the 75 basis point hike, as in. I would be surprised if Bullard wasn't pushing for one percent or Bullard even, and Waller are the two. I think. Yeah, and I mean, and, and and you know, we've we we've heard Esther George, we've heard Cash Kari, we've heard uh, uh, even Jerome Powell has taken that hawkish tone, right? And you know what was really scary is that he mentioned like the Volcker theory, and that's really kind of set the markets oh, yeah. off. When that, he, when that's he talks what set about people Jackson. running to the running to the exits. All right, uh, any final thoughts on tonight, and uh, maybe you know, the next day or so before this podcast come out and we could wrap it up here, brother. Yeah. I mean, I just, you know, I do see the market is like you said, catching a little bit of steam here after hours. Um, you know, in crypto though, we see these fake outs all the time, uh, especially, you know, we, we've seen, you know, liquidation slow down, spot market buying picks up. It seems to be between four and 7 PM a lot of times. And then as Asian markets open, they dump right on us. <laughs> so Damn, you know, that's what gotta, <laughs> yeah, so that's what we got to watch for. But uh, in general, you know, we're just seeing these relief rallies. The only thing I want to point out in crypto is we are not set yet for a true return to a bull market. We're going to continue to see, you know, some of these relief rallies. We started again this week. You know, we dropped on Tuesday last week tremendously. We made that all back up, and then we dropped again. So you know, you want to make sure. What I want to make sure is that our listeners are going in with a, a really good thesis for their trade and setting the parameters like you do in your room that I now do in my room, where it is, here's our first profit target, here's our final exit target profit, and here's our stop loss. And we stick to those. And if you do that, you can be a successful trader in any market. Um, be and disciplined. Not, right. And if you're not, then you're not going to be a successful trader in any market. Quite. Honestly. I agree. A million percent. You know, final thoughts on this end, guys. Listen, don't be married to the highs here. Don't be married on any rally. Definitely expect a nasty pullback to be in the picture over the next two weeks. I believe that the current market environment is more geared towards short-term trading versus long-term investing, yes. even position trading. Be swift. Be extremely disciplined. And understand, with volatility, risk ramps up in correlation with reward. You can't have huge reward without having risk. Make sure you trade accordingly. Make sure you define risk. Make sure you stay disciplined to your stops. It's okay if we're wrong. It's not okay if you refuse to believe that you're wrong and continue to let that stock go against you. Prime example, uh, the other day when CPI came out, there were people that were long, refused to believe that the market was going to drop. The market kept on melting down, kept on melting down, barely bounced back. And who the hell knows? I'm obviously thinking we're going to see a bullish response and then the sell off once again. I just want to preface that, yes, I ended up going long here in TQQQ, TSM. I'm still short KMX, so I still have my partial edge, even though I've already taken profits twice on the way down. And I want you folks to know that I'm looking to fade this rally again. Short term thesis is the way to go until this market gets settled. If You don't want to believe it. And you don't want to be disciplined. 
There are some consequences, and they're usually ugly. So keep that in mind. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to wrap up what I feel is a fantastic episode of Dips to Rips because of my man, Howard. He dropped some great science. Folks, if you like what you heard, do me a favor, comment, like, and subscribe to our channel. You can obviously find this podcast wherever you listen to other podcasts. Guys and gals, if you want to follow us on our socials, Howard, what's yours? Oh, God. (laughs) <laughs> it's like Howard Greenberg. I'm no, sorry, I put well, him on this. He Howard, wasn't ready for it. My bad, dude. Uh, well, it's it's my name, but it's H O W A R D G R E E N E sixteen. Okay. On Twitter. You know, what? let's That's make it easier, it Michael. Twitter. My man, can you just link those in yeah, the video please. when you yeah. drop them? I am the disciple of trend on Instagram and on Twitter. Would love to have your follows. We are out of here. Until next time. Peace and love, everybody. See you next week. This has been Dips to Rips with Howard Greenberg and Charlie Moon, brought to you by Prosper Trading Academy. Visit us at prospertrading.com to find out more. This podcast should not be considered professional financial and or investment advice. By accessing this podcast, you acknowledge that Prosper Trading Academy, LLC, PTA, makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in this podcast. The information and opinions presented in this podcast are for general information only, and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk. PTA does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast, and information from this podcast should not be referenced in any way to imply such approval or endorsement. The third-party materials or content of any third-party site referenced in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinion, standards, or policies of the PTA. PTA assumes no responsibility or liability for the accuracy or completeness of the content contained in third-party materials of the third-party sites referenced in this podcast or the compliance with applicable laws of such materials and or links referenced herein. Moreover, PTA makes no warranty that this podcast or server that it makes it available is free of viruses, worms, or other elements of codes that manifest contaminating or destructive properties. PTA expressly disclaims any and all liability or responsibility for any direct, indirect, incidental, special, consequential, or other damages arising out of any individual's use of, reference to, reliance on, or inability to use this podcast or the information presented in this podcast.